Okay, our next speaker is Dr. David Renner. Dr. Renner is a veterinary epidemiologist at Kansas State University. He's conducted extensive field research to understand the ecology of food safety pathogens, such as E. coli 0157H7 in, in cattle production settings, and that's both on the ranch and in feedlots. He's going to uh, help us understand some of the, the myths that are perpetuated about uh, E. coli 0157 on farms. So thank you, Dr. Renner, for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for the um, introduction as well as the invitation to be here today. It's, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to speak on this topic. Um, like Dr. Besser, um, this is one of my favorite topics and, and I'm most familiar with the aspects of E. coli 0157 as it relates to the on-farm environment. And in fact, my, my title you'll see is The Facts and Fictions Re Regarding STEC 0157 in Cattle. And, and what I want to speak about more specifically as Dr. Smith suggested, was um, highlighting some of the major features of the epidemiology and ecology on farm. So expanding a little bit of, from what Dr. Besser already told us about the on-farm epidemiology of E. coli 0157 in cattle and, and giving a few, few more specific highlights of, of some of the main features and then also dispel some of the myths. There, there's actually uh, in, the, in popular press, there's often discussions of various cattle management practices and those kind of things that are believed to be associated with 015787 in cattle, and that's and a lot of those are actually incorrect. So I want to touch on some of those today. With the underlying theme, as Dr. Besser presented very well, is is the fact that we want to control human health risks by reducing fecal shedding of 0157 in cattle. Um, so that's our overall uh, goal with with many of these efforts. I think Dr. Besser did a great job setting up the fact that you, you really need to think about E. coli 0157 in, in cattle as, as a complex situation where um, we really need to understand uh, aspects of the strains of, of the agent that we're interested in, in this case 0157, shigatoxigenic E. coli, um, also host-related factors in this case, we're most interested in cattle as the host reservoir, um, but there are also other species and, and aspects of the production environment that we need to keep in mind. Um, not only things like feed and water that the cattle consume, but also um, the seasonality and environmental factors and, and things like wildlife, which exist in many of our cattle production environments throughout the country. So, Again, there is some basic understanding of the transmission of E. coli 0157 that I think we need to really keep in mind if we're, we're going to talk about at least potential mechanisms of control in this uh, animal host and, and the environment in which they're raised. Um, the first thing, of, of course, as Dr. Besser said, is that these bacteria are, are shed in the feces of cattle, healthy cattle, um, and you'll hear me talk about fecal shedding because that's one of our are major ways of identifying how much E. coli 0157 is in a population of animals. Um, and then that fecal shedding can lead to transmission through oral ingestion, either um, with people, which co may cause uh, uh, human cases, or what I'm most interested in this talk is how does that impact the infection rates amongst herds and pens and groups of animals in, in the in the cattle production environments, okay? Um, we know that it's in and on healthy cattle in a variety of production systems, so I, I guess that's one of the myths that I think right away we need to discuss and we'll discuss in more detail is oftentimes people think it's, it's just one or a few herds where in fact we know now that multiple herds across the country, in fact any that we've studied very intensively, have a 157, so it's a matter of when and how much and where. Um, and it's not just certain production environments, so certain feedlots, for example. It, we, we see it in extensive production systems as well. So these are some topics that I'm going to really focus on in the next few minutes and, and some major features, I think, of the epidemiology and ecology of shigatoxigenic E. coli in cattle and in cattle production environments. Um, the first one is, is variability, and I'll expand on that in the next few slides, but again, essentially what I'm talking about here is we know that 
E. coli 157 exists in herds, it's, it's how much, how often, and within animals, how much are they shedding as well. So that variability is an important feature that we need to think about. Seasonality is uh, probably the most important feature, and, and Dr. Besser explained that quite well already. Um, Dr. Smith is also going to come back and talk about that a little later today, so I'm not going to focus on that aspect in my talk, but I wanted to mention here because I can't mention E. coli epidemiology in cattle and, and not emphasize enough that the seasonality is a major um, feature that we see. In, in other words, there's much higher uh, shedding levels of E. coli 157 in the summer than, than in the winter, and that's been demonstrated many, many times. Um, I'm going to talk about different production systems, dairy, beef, um, pasture, and, and confined, um, different diets, grain-based, forage-based, um, how those may be, impact our shedding levels in cattle, um, and again, dispel some of the myths that may be out there related to these, these features. Um, the other in more environmental-related topics is, is what about water and wildlife as it relates to transmission of E. coli 157 within cattle production systems. So we'll touch on, on those topics as, as we move forward in the next few minutes. So I already mentioned the variability. I think this, this is one of our biggest challenges, but perhaps one of our biggest opportunities. And again, what I mean there is that um, whether we look at feedlots or, or farms or pasture situations, um, we're not looking for whether or not E. coli 0157 is present because we know that it's present. The question is really how much and how often and where, okay? And so we know there's a lot of variability within groups of animals, both over time and, and over space, and that's been shown um, in several different studies. So we'll talk about that a little bit and how that may relate to risk and transmission. Also, individuals. Individual animals can shed at low levels or very high levels. And, and if you think about that as well, that, that also can impact our risk of transmission, either within the cattle production system or risk um, to human health transmission. So this figure um, comes from one of, one of the studies I did several years ago, and I want to make sure everybody understands this before I move forward. If you look from left to right, you see on the bottom July to December. Um, so, so this is over time, um, and the, the y-axis or the height of, of each one of the, the uh, diamonds that are shown on the graph is, is what percentage of the animals were shedding um, 0157 in their feces. The main take-home message that I want everybody to recognize is the variability, right? You can see pretty obviously that um, there's diamonds, which by the way represent an individual feedlot pen. Um, so each diamond represents one of 44 feedlot pens that were measured on the day they went to harvest. And you see a tremendous amount of variability. Uh, um, that we have pens that went to harvest that 80% of the animals were shedding 0157 in their feces, and we have pens where we didn't detect it in, within that pen, okay? And so the question really, the opportunity, if you will, is if we understood why that was, um, that could be an opportunity for control. If we knew, for example, the two that I circled, what was different about them, that may be a potential for control mechanism. So, but I can tell you these two that I've circled are from the same feedlot on the same day, fed the same diet, the same environmental conditions, okay? So it's not some of the easy answers. They're, they're just not there. Um, I would suggest that what we're measuring at a snapshot in time, and if we followed these pins prior to and after this point, you would see that it goes up and down because that's what we've shown in other studies that the prevalence actually goes up and down over time. But the main take-home message, again, is that there's tremendous variability from pen to pens, even within a feedlot, and this is all within one feedlot, okay? So there's also pretty tremendous variability within individual animals. So if you look at all the animals that test positive, for example, many of them are shedding at pretty low levels of, of E. coli 157, just at our detection limit, which is about 100 cells uh, per gram of feces, but a small subset, approximately 10% of them, are shedding at tremendously high levels um, 
10 or 100 or 1,000 times more than their pen mates, okay? So 10% of the animals can shed 90% of the E. coli 157 within a population. And you'll, you've heard probably, you may have heard those being referred to as super shedders or high shedders. There's been a lot of focus on, on that aspect of it because it does relate to transmission risk, right? If some animals are shedding much higher levels, that can um, increase risk for herd mates as well as um, transmission to people. But I think what, what we need to focus on is, is the question that I've got on the title of my slide here. So I'd ask you to focus on that and not the graph right away. Is, is it a difference between different animals and host factors, or is it just different phases in, of infection? And I think over the last few years, there's been pretty good research to demonstrate, in fact, that it's not just an animal-related factor. There's not 10% of the animals that are different, and if we just remove those, the, the problem would go away. The simple answer doesn't exist, and, and that's been shown in a couple different studies. This graph I'm showing is just showing three calves. Um, it, it allows us maybe to see it a little easier. Uh, over a 14-day period, again, from left to right, is, goes from day one to day 14, and, and the height of each one of those bars is how much E. coli 157 was in the feces of, of each of these three calves. And without getting into any details, I, I just want you to appreciate that it goes up and down quite a bit, even from day to day, where some animals are shedding um, millions of back 0157 in their feces one day, and the next day we can't even detect it. And then the next day they would be, again, what we would refer to as maybe a super shedder. So, it's phases of infection, not necessarily the animals. And, and again, whether it's variability in pens or variability in individuals, um, it's important to consider that variability when we talk about risk to transmission, and not only to people, but also within, within herds. Another topic that I think needs to be addressed is, again, the, the effects of both diet and production systems. And, and this is often um, a, a pretty, uh, I don't know if it's controversial, but a fairly hot topic in that people want to know how animals are raised, and, and there's a, some misconceptions about, well, if you just fed them this or fed them that or raised them in certain environments, we wouldn't have that problem. And, and so I want to speak to that a little bit. Probably the biggest misconception that we've seen in the popular press for um, since I was in grad school, with, which was 15 years ago or so, and uh, Dr. Besser pointed out just last week, it was in the news again, is, is the impact of grass-fed versus grain-fed related to E. coli 157. There's a big misconception that if we didn't feed grain, we wouldn't have E. coli 157 in cattle feces, and, and that's just not true, and there's a variety of studies that have shown that. Um, I'm not gonna go through them here today. What I would do is refer you, uh, if you look at the bottom of this slide, there's a link to some work that Dr. Smith and his colleagues did to review the literature pretty um, comprehensively. And in a nutshell, what they found was part of this misconception may just be in the definition of what was measured in those studies. So there are several studies that measured E. coli in a generic or general sense. As Dr. Besser said, there are lots of E. coli that are not pathogenic for people. Um, and many of those studies that show um, grain feeding increasing E. coli weren't measuring the pathogen, E. coli 157. They were measuring generic E. coli, okay? In fact, when you look at the studies that actually focused on E. coli 157, the pathogen, um, they in fact show that increased shedding levels or increased duration of shedding if you feed forage or grass or, or, or pasture um, type diets. So quite opposite of what, what you may have seen in the, in the press, okay? A similar misconception um, is related to the, the type of production environment where cattle were raised. So um, if you see in this picture, there, there are cattle on extensive grassland where they're, they're not high-density um, pen situations. And many people believe if we left animals in that situation, we wouldn't have 0157 problems. Or, or if calves that came off the, the, the cows in this situation never went to a feedlot, they wouldn't be shedding 0157. And again, that's a, a big misconception. Been shown in several studies. I, I've got one on this slide that um, they demonstrated more than 80% of calves 
have, have been exposed to 0157 before they even left this environment, and all of the herds were positive, okay? There's another study that, uh, that I led several years ago where we looked at these wean calves that typically either go to feedlot or go to a pasture, and when we compared those similar aged animals, we didn't find any difference in, in levels of shedding of E. coli 157. So it's, it's not just those that go to confinement or pens. Another topic that sometimes come up is, is people have different, um, you see different beef production systems, you see diff beef products in the grocery stores from organic programs and natural programs, and, and, and there are a variety of those. Um, we did a study a few years ago, and there's been some others, but this one was focused on how much fecal shedding was in the animals when they went to harvest at a plant that, that harvested animals in, in these different types of production systems. And um, if you can see the height of the purple bars on your, on your right, they're pretty similar, and, and there's no um, obvious distinction that between these different production systems and the, and the amount of E. coli 157 in the feces. And so, again, one of the misconceptions that I think if you actually look at the data that there, there aren't um, dramatic differences there. Another topic that's, that's been in the press and, and has been a bit of a controversial topic um, is related to feeding cattle distillers grains. And um, some of you may not be familiar with what distillers grains are, the process, but um, most of us are probably familiar with putting gas in our cars and, and are fam maybe familiar with the fact that over the last um, five years or so, there's been more and more eth ethanol production. Essentially, um, a simplified version of that is we take corn and, and we remove the starch and sugars and we create ethanol. And what's left is basically corn without starch and sugars, which is called distillers grains. And I'm my colleagues in the, that are uh, experts in this field will say I've very much oversimplified that, but that's, that is essentially what we have. And it turns out that those distillers grains, which is a very good quality cattle feed, um, and if you look at the economics and the, and the availability of corn, more and more corn goes to ethanol production. Distillers grains are a very good cattle feed, a good source of fiber, fat, protein, supplement, either as a, as a protein supplement or an energy supplement. And instead of using the, the whole product, in this case corn, many times it's, it's, it's a bit of a trade-off. So, and what we've seen in several studies, and, and some other people have looked at this as well, um, not always the same consistency in terms of results, but by and large it seems if you take corn out of the diet and replace it with distiller's grains, um, we see in, a higher level of E. coli 0157 in the cattle feces, okay? We don't really know why that occurs, but if you think about what I just said related to forage feeding and grain feeding, it seems to be sort of a similar story in, in that we're taking the, the high starch concentrated corn out of, out of the diet and some of the other components are changing and, and we're adding distiller's grain in there. We see um, a higher level of 0157. Again, much like the grain feeding results that Dr. Smith and his colleagues did um, determine on, during their review. So, in a nutshell, I think there are a lot of, lot of things that have been looked at related to cattle diet and E. coli 157, and, and, and to simplify something that's not easily simplified, I think the couple take-home messages are, it, there's definitely a relationship between diet and fecal shedding. Um, but just as Dr. Besser said in his presentation, it's not a simple situation and there's not a simple answer. Um, I, I do think it's an opportunity because we know there's an impact related to diet and fecal shedding that if we could determine the mechanism related to that, it may be a, a fairly good opportunity to develop a control um, programs, and, but we're just, not, we're just not at that point right now in terms of, of research and, and understanding of the mechanisms. So the last topic, I'm going to tell a little, little story, I guess, an example of, of why the, we need to think about the ecology and, and environment that the cattle are raised on. Uh, this picture is a picture of the Kansas Flint Hills. And yes, if you look from here, um, Kansas looks pretty flat. 
Um, but hopefully you'll notice that those are hills and down in the bottom there in the middle of the picture are trees. We do have trees in Kansas. Um, this is a great place to raise cattle and, and some of us like living there too. Um, but I wanted to point out this picture because you can see the trees there on the bottom of the, the hills. And then when I show the next picture here, this is an aerial photo of one of the ranches that we've done quite a bit of research on. And those dark areas are those trees. So that helps orientate you a little bit that off to the left or right where it looks quite light, that's the top of the hills and the, and the trees are down the bottom of the hills. And again, this is a ranch that we've done quite a bit of uh, research on. Um, the blue line that I just put up is a, is a creek that runs through the ranch. Um, and we sampled um, pretty intensively this ranch and several others in, in this area and also in an area in Nebraska a few years ago. In this example, if you see these diamonds here on the creek, those are places where we found E. coli 157 in the creek. Um, we also found E. coli 157 in, in this pen where there were some, some um, heifers next to the ranch in a pen. The, the two yellow shapes that I'm showing you are the, uh, the, the fences, the boundaries of pastures where we also found E. coli 157. And these were all the same strain of E. coli 157 as, as, as Dr. Besser mentioned. There's fingerprinting methods that we could determine these are the same strain. And we also found the same strain in the feces of a, of a possum that was again right in this area by the creek here. So, um, and this is not to point the blame to the possum or the creek for that matter. It's just to, for the understanding that it is an ecological system that we need to talk about and things like water and wildlife don't necessarily mine the boundaries of fences. Um, we found the same strain in other ranches in, in this part of Kansas and again I'm not blaming the possum. I don't think he put that many miles on across all these ranches but we do see that and we see um, you know, if we want to talk about wildlife species, Dr. Besser already mentioned there, there are many different wildlife species that have been, and, and domestic species that have been found to shed E. coli in 0157 in their feces, um, some of which you may have heard of, of human cases related to shedding in deer um, or shedding in feral pigs was involved in, in the spinach outbreak years ago. Um, so again, it's, it's not just cattle, there's one take home message. And, and it's also, the other take home message is if we are trying to control it in cattle farms, we have to recognize that these species um, can easily move across, across borders and boundaries. And um, it may not show up very good, but the picture in the middle is, is a picture of starlings. And there's been quite a bit of work on starlings, which there are tremendously big flocks of starlings that move between dairies and feedlots and in many parts of, of our cattle production states in this country. So. Something we definitely need to keep in mind if we're, we're talking about ways that we control e, e. coli 0157 or, or control human exposure um, related to E. coli 0157. So with that, um, a couple slides to summarize. I think in my career, and we've, we've come a long way in terms of better understanding the risks of E. coli 0157 uh, related to cattle and cattle production environments. Um, in terms of the epidemiology and, and the spread amongst herds and, and even the factors like seasonality and, and variability within pens and within animals. Um, we have a much better understanding that of those features than we did um, years ago. We know that it's not as simple as grass versus grain fed, for example, um, but we do know that diet can, could be a potential uh, opportunity. Um, we know it's not just cattle and pens that we see E. coli 0157 in, in pasture environments. And as I just finished talking about, it, it's not just cattle. I mean, that's our primary focus. And I think it's important to keep our focus on that. But, the, but other species, including wildlife and, and including people, which I didn't talk about, are, are also um, potential points of transmission either to, to animals or to other people. Okay. I think that there are some, there still are some opportunities in terms of the ecology and the epidemiology. And, and you know, when we look at variability among groups or, or variability among individuals, and I showed some of those data, um, it certainly is complex and it certainly is a challenge, but I, I'd like to think about it a little bit from the other direction is those, that also is a potential opportunity 
where we know some of these things occur, if we could figure out the mechanism behind it, it could be an opportunity for control at the farm level, and we're just we're not there right now. Um, I also hope covering some of those myths help dispel those issues in, in all of our communications related to Equal I-157, because I think it, um, it's counterproductive. It maybe gets us off the point where we need to be in terms of moving forward with control measures. So, With that, thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be here, and, and I will turn it over to the moderator. And then let's thank Dr. Renton for his presentation.